This video is brought to you by Charlie Presumed Dead by Anne Heltzel, coming from HMH on June 2nd. In Paris, family and friends gather to mourn the passing of Charlie Price, a young globetrotter presumed dead after a horrible accident. At his funeral, Charlie's two girlfriends, Lena and Aubrey, discover each other's existence. As the trails of Charlie's deception leads the two girls across Europe and Asia, their deepening friendship sustains them in their search for the truth. But, of course, they both have secrets of their own. What will happen when they discover the truth about each other and the truth about Charlie? Find out with Charlie Presumed Dead by Anne Heltzel, coming out June 2nd. Hi everybody, this is Josh Corman from BookRiot.com, back to talk a little bit more about the Read Harder Challenge. The task I'm going to be talking about in this video is the one that asks us to read a book by someone whose gender is different than our own. Now obviously that's going to be a different deal for different people who are watching this video. Since I'm operating these videos from my own perspective, the books that I recommend today might not work for everybody. But hopefully they give you a good idea of the kinds of things that you can go out and look for if you're trying to complete this task of the Read Harder Challenge. Now, in addition to looking for books written by someone whose gender is different than my own, I also wanted to find writers whose experiences in general uh, were different than my own because I think that that kind of adds to the effect that we're going for with the Read Harder Challenge. And I wanted to give myself and readers like me the chance to reach out into some of those places as a reader that they might not normally get to, as we've been trying to do all through the Read Harder Challenge, all through these videos. With that in mind, the first book that I'd like to recommend is Jesmyn Ward's Men We Reaped. In 2011, her novel Salvage the Bones won the National Book Award. This book is a memoir. It is a chronicle of the loss of several men in Jesmyn Ward's life who were important to her in one way or another and whose deaths on the surface seem unconnected, but as Ward writes, she uncovers a lot of maybe unseen connective tissue that links the loss of life that she explores in this book uh, from one person to the next. By doing that, she's able to examine the effects of that loss, not just on her personally, but on her community and communities like it around the country. Ward is an African-American woman from Mississippi, and the men whose loss of life she talks about uh, are African-American as well. And their deaths, she kind of comes to realize, are not merely the result of bad luck or happenstance but actually rooted in a lot of systemic national and cultural issues that we sadly are still experiencing at an all too persistent rate. Men We Reaped is not an easy book uh, to read. The subject matter and the raw emotional nature of it are in spots very challenging, very tough to get through. Uh, but I would encourage you, if that's something that might put you off from reading uh, a book, I would really encourage you to try and, and still get into this because that difficulty, I think, breeds, um, if not answers, it breeds a really healthy exploration of some really uh, frustrating and complicated and difficult to deal with topics that, as I said, are such a part of our national conversation today uh, that being able to read something like this and experience the outlook that Ward offers us from the perspective that she delivers um, is really enriching uh, and edifying. Um, and it's something that I feel like made me uh, more ready to listen, not, not necessarily more ready to talk about or to offer advice or to tell people how things are, uh, but more equipped to listen uh, fairly and openly to people whose experiences have not looked a whole lot like mine. Uh, and that's one of the great values of, of books, the empathy that they offer. Uh, and Jesmyn Ward's Men We Reaped is exactly that. It offers us a chance to engage in that kind of empathy even as it saddens us, even as it might be really difficult to face. Uh, I think that that's something worth doing, worth facing down, uh, and this book is about as good as it can get if you're looking for a space to engage in some of those difficult topics uh, about systemic racism and prejudice and uh, the ways in which that root kind of infects uh, the entire tree of, uh, of really the country. You know, it's localized in some ways by uh, the South here, but we see evidence of it all over the place. Uh, and so it offers us a real opportunity to, to get involved and engage with those ideas uh, in a way that is only going to be helpful. She's an excellent writer. Don't miss out on Jesmyn Ward. The second recommendation I'd like to make is also a nonfiction book, uh, one that I really like, one of the best pieces of nonfiction that I've read in the last several years. I like it so much, in fact, that I've assigned it a couple of times to my AP English language students as summer reading. Uh, and it's really great to watch a book that comes from a place that students typically don't have a lot of experience with uh, and really make an impact on them. 
The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks by Rebecca Skloot is a deeply researched and profoundly personal piece of nonfiction. Uh, the book starts as an exploration of the life of one woman, Henrietta Lacks, who died in the 1950s after a prolonged series of medical difficulties. And over the course of her treatments, doctors at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore took from her some cells as they were trying to figure out and study and treat what was wrong with her. Um, and they took the cells without her knowledge, without her consent. Obviously the concept of medical consent has developed a lot since those days, but even still, Henrietta was an African-American woman being treated at a clinic that didn't necessarily take the rights of their patients as seriously as they might have other patients, white patients, uh, or obviously patients closer to today. But the crazy thing about Henrietta cells is that when they were taken and they were studied in a lab and they were put in culture, the doctors found that they did not die, uh, that they multiplied at a rate much, much more quickly than the other cells perished. And so for all intents and purposes, they had immortal cells on their hands to do research with. And this discovery ended up having boundless impact on the medical community. HeLa cells, as we are told that they are known in the book, they are still used in medical labs today. And the sale of these cells has generated millions and millions and millions of dollars in revenue. There's probably not a medical research lab in the world that you can go and not find some of Henrietta's cells still multiplying to this day. Now, Rebecca Skloot approaches that story, tells Henrietta's side of it, asks some really interesting questions about medical ethics and about the impacts of race and class on medical decisions, especially uh, back in the 1940s and 50s, but questions that also reach further into today. Uh, she actually links up with members of Henrietta's family who for a very long time had no idea that their mother's cells had been taken. And Rebecca Skloot meets with them, talks with them, interviews them for the book, makes them a part of the story. So it's equal parts medical investigation and investigation of these ethical questions surrounding the field of medicine, and also kind of a personal drama that unfolds as she tries to help Henrietta's family understand what has happened to their mother's cells, the ways in which they're being used by the medical community to this day, and what that means for them. They never saw any compensation at all or any recognition at all uh, about Henrietta's contribution to medicine. And so as Rebecca Skloot helps them understand exactly what's going on, we get to see uh, some of the after effects that still linger in Henrietta's family. Poverty and the medical difficulties that they face have combined to make really, really challenging life situations for them. I loved this book. It reads, maybe if not like fiction, very compulsively. It is built around the narrative of Henrietta and her family going down the generations and so probably avoids the drier pitfalls that some medical nonfiction is likely to run into. It won all sorts of awards when it came out, absolutely deserved them. If you pick up The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, I guarantee you that you will learn something that you did not know and you will get a chance to ask some really challenging and engaging questions about medical ethics and the ways that they have and have not progressed since the 1950s. The role of race and class in medicine and the inequalities still inherent to our medical system and to our country as a whole. We'll change gears with the last recommendation and take a look at some fiction. The Land of Love and Drowning by Tiffany Yannike. Uh, this is a book about two sisters in the Virgin Islands whose lives end up in a very different place than they began. The novel begins with them, the daughters of a pretty well-to-do merchant whose ship sinks. They're left without their wealth, without their status, and must kind of navigate life from that point forward on their own. One daughter wants to cling desperately to the old colonial privileges that she had been granted. Uh, she still feels a desire to be a part of that society. Her younger sister, by contrast, breaks with a lot of those old colonial traditions, is much more uh, in tune with the island culture. And those two ideas, the colonial upper class culture and the more native culture of the Virgin Islands, are at war throughout most of this book. And it takes the form of the conflicts between the two sisters, the conflicts between their two desires and how they play those out. This is a wrenching, emotionally complex novel filled with characters whose motivations we question at every turn. Uh, and that questioning, I think, makes the novel richer because there is not a whole lot of predictability in The Land of Love and Drowning. And this novel does an excellent job of exploring the role that women play in their society, but also the challenges that they face almost universally in gaining an independent life that is built from their own decision-making and the paths that they've chosen rather than what is laid out before them. 
And though their choices may not always lead to the results that they expect, and though they may make some missteps along the way, the two sisters are very much working and fighting to be in charge of their own destinies. And that working and that fighting really drives uh, the novel. I can honestly say I've never read anything like The Land of Love and Drowning, which is a high compliment. It is fantastic. Definitely pick it up if you are interested in magical realism, strong female characters, a change in setting from what you're likely used to, and a fantastic story. Let us know in the comments section below or on social media what books you found to go along with the gender different than your own task of the Read Harder Challenge. Use the hashtag Read Harder for all those social media posts so we can check them out, share those ideas with each other, and get some more great recommendations. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.